pretty good setting in terms of you know you've diagnosed it, you've <laughs> assessed what to do, the only thing is how are you going to access it. Um, and, and in fact, all the data that was presented so far in terms of results, most of it was assumed to be um, gradient stenotomy. I start by, I'm a bit of a sucker for quotations, and this probably will apply to Brexit, but please be patient and think about it during this presentation. The positive thinker th sees the invisible, feels the intangible, and believes the impossible. However beautiful the strategy, look at occasionally the results. I've often had to eat my words, but it's been a wholesome meal and I love that. A lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has had a chance to put its pants on. So I've been given a very good topic. I've been given a topic of mitral surgery is best performed through midline stenotomy. So mitral surgery, I'm going to break down the title. It includes repair, replacement, concomitant procedures, and concomitant procedures could include CABG, aortic valve, ischemic MR, ventricular function. There are many newfangled terms, atrial functional MR, ventricular functional MR, and of course tricuspid intervention and all that. So best perform, it doesn't mean only perform. So we go to the second part of my title, which is best perform, not only. And we are comparing what? We are comparing full sternotomy versus various plethora of minimal invasive techniques. And I, Dr. Chit would uh, kindly summarize the levels of uh, invasion that you can get uh, from level one to level four, which is uh, full robotic. So it's a collection of techniques. And uh, apart from the techniques, it's more about also cannulation, central peripheral pathology, and whether infective endocarditis. So we'll try and see. Uh, Dr. Bogers and Dr. Gillinov kindly summarized uh, for us. So this is the criteria where it, mitral valve should only be performed in contraindications to mitral valve. Uh, to minimal invasive. So I, I won't read that, but this is a table which is an absolute contraindication. So we are trying to see it's, it's limiting what minimally invasive you can do. And then we go to relative contraindication. So we've got another chapter which is a relative contraindication. Quite a little bit interesting. You have more discussion. You've got some mild coronary disease. People go to the extent of trying to do hybrid. But no, we'll, we'll have a discussion and we'll see how it works. And some of them could be translated into relative or absolute. So let's stick by what is possible. Mitral surgery, which is repair or replacement, as we saw, and concomitant associated with mitral. I'm not going to go into coronaries because those are absolute contraindications. So tricuspid valve AF ablation and management of the left atrial appendage, which the morning session was also all about. And the issues are myocardial protection, left ventricle, right ventricle remodeling, bypass time, cross clamp time, com complications include venous drainage, endoaortic clamps, retrograde circulation, and what are the advantages and disadvantages. Now, I don't really want to go on talking about whether there have been many trials. Uh, this is just a depiction of what it should, it may look like. Uh, because there hasn't been any randomized trial. It's a surgeon institution preference, experience. It's a totally different patient population. And there seems to be not much grounds for debate, is there? Because the difference is, is it only the incision that we're talking about? And the recovery maybe within a few weeks instead of three months? What about the long term? Is this translation into a perceived benefit for the surgeon, for the institution, for the patient. And essentially, what happens after the short term, not just to the mitral valve? We don't want a valve which is leaking. We want to have durability. And what happens to left ventricle, right ventricle modeling? I mean, we are all, like many others, very interested in seeing what happens to the remodeling of the right ventricle and the left ventricle, and I have published various data. You've got a lot of new technology, 3D and speckle, and amongst various groups, we are also a group who have published extensively in guidelines, in position papers, in flow charts. And you see what it says in the flow chart. There is a repair indication. It does not say the access. It's assumed to be median sternotomy. There are some lines coming in now. And of course, there is room for a selected population. So what I thought is rather than go around for the non-median sternotomy techniques, I'll stick with that. 
because median sternotomy is taken as a reference, it's a gold standard. They're all non-sternotomy manuscripts talk about as safe as, as durable as, less or equal complications, repair rates, etc. So where else a better place to start than the STS database, um, which is the isolated mitral valve surgery database. This was presented at the last mitral conclave. Clearly, a lot of repair rates are increasing, stabilizing. But what is more important is, as highlighted, uh, look at the number of centers that do more than 100. Yes, of course, uh, many major centers do that. But like the UK, we have a lot of centers doing between 0 to 6 or 6 to 25. And we'll come at the magical figure of 25 and try and understand what we are talking about. And generally, this is a, a repair rate. And I concentrate on the second half, which is the degenerative pathology. And uh, we have repair rates around mid-60s, which is what follows in the United Kingdom as well. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that. What are the various techniques that I used? Most commonly, anuloplasty, very high, 96%. We are not very far. We do have various other techniques that are associatedly used. But I want you to look at the use of artificial cordae, which is upcoming. And this data is probably a little old, but this is what we have as the best data. And in the second half, uh, second para, look at um, just over three quarters of those with severe MR undergoing present with symptoms. Only 10% are referred to operation without symptoms. And more than 1,000 patients per year with degenerative receive a valve replacement as first-line surgical therapy or left the OR with moderate or severe after attempted mitral repair. And this is, in the same manuscript, this is a appendix table that tells you pre-discharge um, degenerative prolapse uh, having 83% known to trace. This is pre-discharge, intra-op, leaving the hospital, not follow-up still. Uh, 11 per, 11, around 12% mild and around 2 to 3% moderate. So maybe we are setting the tone for further leak. Now, I know for one thing, the OE, observed expected ratio, if you're talking about mortality, it should be zero, uh, less than one. You're, you're doing pretty good if your observed to expected mortality is less than one. But look at those um, uh, less than 23 cases. The OE ratio is coming up as one, and more than 23 is coming up as 0.5. I try to look in the manuscript for further discussion, but I'll leave it there. There seems to be a permanent pacemaker threefold higher in the replacement group, but I won't go too much into that. A concomitant tricuspid was performed in nearly 16%, and among patients with AF, only 15%. Now, you know, a concomitant AF is a class one indication now, and every patient should try and do that. Maybe it is again going to go. In 16% of the cases, the surgeon attempted a repair before replacing the qual, uh, but was unsuccessful. Um, and the rate of attempted but unsuccessful repair was 27%. Uh, clearly, we need to have referral centers because that increases the rate of repair. And in conclusion, patients undergoing primary isolated mitral valve commonly have ventricular dysfunction, AF, and heart failure and contemporary outcomes are excellent. This is sternotomy. We need to have more referral. So let's just look at a little bit about reoperation. What kind of reoperations in the mitral? Most commonly, patients undergoing mitral reoperation had a repair previous in 36% of the cases, and 27% of the cases had a replacement. Uh, the rest of the group was uh, others. And one of the most significant operative factor for uh, operative mortality in the multivariate logistic regression analysis was mitral repair. May I just borrow um, uh, Dr. Gilinov's uh, fantastic, if you look, this is very impressive, look at this, um, 4,000 in excess of surgery, one of the best premier centers, and a very large number of robotic assisted surgeries, and one of the largest number of mitral repairs done. But even there, there's a high selection of groups and, 
and, and maybe just over a third undergoing robotic. And repair rate bothers around 65%. What about the United Kingdom? This is the Blue Book Online, and, and of course, I made the workforce report, so I can tell you that there are 38 units that we are working. What I do want to highlight here is this is the data for isolated primary mitral wall repair, first time. Look at LV function. Combine the fair and poor, and you get around 20%. This is isolated first time repair plus CABG. You get the isolate, uh, fair and poor LV that jumps up to 45 percent, 20 to 45. So we are now highly super selecting a case. But even if you ha ended up replacing the valve, your LV function is still 28 percent. So 20 percent, 45, 30. And then if you did a replacement plus graft, it's almost 50 percent. So you are doing an operation which is super selected. Um, Wolfgang Haringe published the German registry. I don't have too much detail analysis. There are some points that I picked up. 50% of the patients undergo minimal invasive in Germany, definitely. Uh, dominantly male. I don't know why. I can't explain that. Uh, but, but, but their repair rates are similar, 63%, which, is, which, is, which seems to be a figure everywhere. Even the UK is there. We are all there. Uh, this is uh, another uh, m analysis of uh, Dr. Gillianov, a very large experience and very good experience. I'm not going to go too much into that because uh, Dr. Gillianov will probably talk about it and also share his uh, five tips. But I just want to highlight some points raised by our close friend Annie uh, in the invited community, uh, commentary. That there is a preponderance of young, minimally symptomatic patients with minimal comorbidity who typically have early degenerative disease. Higher use of simple repair techniques such as triangular, probably also reflecting simpler valve disease. Synonymous with mitral valve surgery on patients with low comorbidity, on higher socioeconomic status, and for early valve disease and the inextricable link between robotic and referral bias, selection bias, complexity of repair bias, patient comorbidity, surgeon-related, and institutional factors. What about the learning curve? Well, we all have a learning curve, and it is important to have a learning curve. Again, a very interesting manuscript published, and again, uh, Dr. Gillian wrote a very nice editorial on the subspeciality of mitral wall. Uh, this manuscript said that uh, approximately 25 is, seems to be the number that you need to achieve a year to maintain your proficiency at a high repair rate, okay? And once you have that, um, if you look at various other manuscripts, uh, if you're doing 25 to 50 cases per year, you can take anywhere between three to five, six years. However, if you start your training in minimal invasive early, you may be able to reduce that, and then you need to keep on doing 25 cases. As you know, I hate Venn diagrams, and that's why I've always come up with P triangles. So there is clearly a option of a minimal invasive, and there is a highly super selected population that would benefit However, for the majority of surgeons, not because they are not highly skilled, every surgeon is very highly skilled, but it's the patient population that you're faced with. Median sternotomy remains the best option. And I'll now show you two interesting uh, slides. This is a parachute used to prevent death and major trauma when jumping from aircraft, clearly. Yes, it's not possible to do that trial. Parachutes are routinely used to prevent death or major traumatic injury among individuals jumping from aircraft, but their efficacy is based primarily on biological possibility and expert opinion. No randomized trials of parachute use have been attempted, presumably owing to lack of equipoise. That's the number. That's the word that I've been using many times as people tell me. This randomized trial found no use no reduction in death or major injury compared with individuals jumping from aircraft with an empty backpack. Lack of enrollments of individuals at high risk could have influenced. And listen to the comment. It has long been assumed that para parachutes decrease mortality in patients who jump from patients due in part to the influence from the parachute manufacturers and in part to sporadic case reports. This important trial cast doubt on the utility of parachute, yet as this is not power. 
I won't read that. Second one, sunglasses may play a role in depression. Uh, since sunlight has antidepressant effect, and since sunglasses reduce sunlight exposure, we hypothesize that sunglasses may play a role in depression. I would highly recommend that you read the Annals of Improbable Research, of which I am proud to be a member, and this Saturday at the Imperial College we'll be hosting the next meeting of the AIR, and I'll leave you as last year with Sapiens, a quotation from my favorite author, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, 21 lessons for 21st century in a world deluged by irrelevant information, clarity is power. Censorship works not by blocking the flow of information, but by distractions, flooding people with disinformation, and you would be better off reading the 21st. Thank you.